My name is Dr. Joe Sprinkle, and this video will be a continuing uh, a continuation of my uh, videos on hermeneutics, and it'll be the uh, second video on my history of hermeneutics. This video will concentrate on early Jewish and rabbinic interpretation. There are examples of Bible interpretation for all the ancient Jewish sources that we have. One of those sources is at a place called Qumran. Qumran was where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1947. Uh, they had been placed in jars by sectarian Jews who had settled along the Dead Sea in the first century of the Christian era. And those placing the scrolls there, perhaps to be identified as Essenes, the group besides the Sadducees and the Pharisees, mentioned by uh, also by uh, first century Jewish writers uh, Philo and Josephus. Well, anyway, at Qumran, there were commentaries on the Bible that uh, were preserved. And scholars uh, label these texts as uh, Pesher texts because Pesher is the Hebrew word for interpretation. And the most complete commentary is a portion of Habakkuk that includes the biblical texts uh, and uh, um, also uh, the commentary on it. And these commentaries show the kind of hermeneutics that uh, they were practicing in this Qumran community, and we'll call that a uh, Pesher uh, hermeneutics. Now, the way that they uh, did their commentaries is that they would first of all begin by quoting the text. And the quoting the text is the, uh, the word itself, the davar is the Hebrew word for word. So they would give the word, the davar, the Hebrew text itself, and that would be at the top of the pesher. And then underneath, they would give the pesher, or the interpretation of what the text means. And an example of this is uh, the scroll on Habakkuk, the pesher of Habakkuk. Uh, the davar says in chapter 1 and verse 4, the wicked encompass the righteous. But then the Pesher at the bottom of the page says, oh, the wicked refers to the wicked priest. And that was evidently one of the Hasmonean rulers at the time, uh, at the time, the, the Jewish rulers who uh, were not uh, Jewish enough as far as the uh, commentator is concerned. And the righteur, righteous uh, is the teacher of righteousness which from other texts at Qumran seems to be the founder of the Qumran community. So this verse in Habakkuk, the wicked encompass the righteous, uh, means that the uh, wicked priest is uh, basically uh, persecuting the teacher of righteousness. Or another example, it says, I am raising up the Chaldeans, which means the Babylonians, that uh, ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwelling places not their own. That's Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 6. But then the interpretation, the Pesher, Chaldeans refer to the Katim, uh, the coastlands by which they mean the Romans. And so as we look at these interpretations, uh, the Peshers at uh, Qumran, uh, we see that these Essenes at Qumran saw mysterious hidden meanings that go beyond the original meanings in the prophecy. Uh, so in Habakkuk, when it says that the uh, uh, wicked encompass the righteous, it was talking about what was going on in Habakkuk's day. It didn't have anything to do with what, with what was happening at the uh, time that the Qumran community was active. And so their interpretation goes against the grammatical historical sense. But what they tended to do instead was to make everything speak of their very own day. 
and uh, certain prophecy buffs today make exactly the same mistake, shall we say. They take every prophecy of scripture and make it fit the latest newspaper headlines to find mysterious meanings uh, in the text. I remember as a young Christian that uh, uh, there was a preacher on the radio that absolutely insisted that the then Secretary of State under Richard Nixon was uh, uh, Henry Kissinger was the Antichrist. Well, I think at the time of this recording, Henry Kissinger may still be alive, but he's a very old man, and it does not appear that he is ever going to prove to be the Antichrist. Uh, but uh, again, if you read the Bible and you try to make it fit the latest uh, newspaper headlines, uh, you will come up with interpretations that fit that preconception. Uh, they did that at Qumran, and there are people that interpret the Bible that way today. Well, let me move on to another group of early Jewish interpreters, the rabbis. The early uh, Jewish exegesis of rabbinic Judaism. Rabbinic Judaism refers to the kind of Judaism that flourished from New Testament times till around the 5th or 6th century AD. It's basically a tradition of the Pharisees in New Testament times. Rabbinic Judaism itself looked back to Ezra the scribe as their founding father of Judaism. A key text that one could look at would be in Nehemiah chapter 8. Uh, where it says, and also Yeshua and Benai and uh, Yuri uh, Baya and uh, Jamin and Akub and various other ones, uh, and the Levites explained the law to the people while the people remained in, in their place. And they read the, uh, from the book of the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. And so uh, they would read the text, and then they would explain the text in verse 7. Uh, they explained the law while the people remained in their place, and then they would give the sense, translating the give the sense. Um, and uh, there's you know, two ways that you could explain that uh, translating. One could be it's just paraphrasing it in an easier language. Uh, but you have to understand that uh, uh, at this time, these are Jews that had come back from Babylonian exile, and many of them <clears throat> spoke Aramaic as their first language. And so in their case, it may have been necessary to take the Hebrew and to translate it into Aramaic so that people could understand it. So they'd explain it, they would also translate it. Now, ultimately, the need to translate the Old Testament into Aramaic for Jews that came back from, Aram uh, from uh, Babylonian exile resulted in a uh, translation called the Aramaic Targums. Uh, these are early translations of the Hebrew Old Testament into Aramaic, uh, which was the language of the Jews that returned from Babylonian exile. And these Targums often paraphrase, giving more interpretation than simply literal translation. And there are two uh, major, uh, well, uh, traditional targums that have uh, been used uh, traditionally by rabbinic Jews, or by Jews within the uh, Pharisaic uh, Jewish tradition, the targum of Ankylos, which translated the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah or the Pentateuch into Aramaic, and then there are also the Targum of uh, Pseudo-Jonathan that translates the Book of the Prophets into Aramaic. There are other Aramaic translations that we know from antiquity that are older than these, uh, but these are the classic ones that uh, uh, traditional Jews study to this day. Now, there are uh, also translations that were necessary into Greek. Uh, as uh, Alexander the Great came and conquered the, uh, the world in which the Jews lived, uh, many people started speaking the Greek language 
In Egypt, they spoke Greek. In Palestine, many people spoke Greek. And around uh, uh, the Roman world, they began speaking Greek because of Alexander's conquests, uh, even into Mesopotamia. And uh, because of that influence of the Greek language, uh, there was a need for Jews to translate the Bible into Greek. And that early Jewish translation into Greek uh, that uh, took place from, oh, say, the uh, second century BC to uh, uh, around the first century BC uh, is called the Septuagint. Uh, this is not a part of rabbinic Judaism, but it's also a part of the early Jewish tradition. So just as rabbinic Judaism produced the Aramaic Targums, uh, other branches of Judaism translated the Bible into Greek. Now, behind the need for interpretation, along with the reading of the text, developed in rabbinic Judaism the concept of oral law. That is, standardized rabbinic interpretations of the law. The law, oral law represents a systematizing of Jewish traditions about uh, the law. And it came to be written down in, uh, um, in what is called the Babylonian uh, Talmud. Uh, these oral laws, they were handed down orally, but then around AD 200, they started to be written down. The Hebrew versions of them were written down, and then Aramaic commentaries of them were added. The, um, uh, the Mishnah was the original writing of it down, and the Gomorrah was the uh, commentaries in, uh, in Aramaic that were added, and those two together constitute uh, what is called the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, traditions of uh, hundreds of rabbis up until about AD 600. And in practice, the Talmud came to supplant the Bible as the object of study for pious Orthodox Jews. Again, uh, two parts of it, the Mishnah, which was written down around AD 200, uh, basically written in Hebrew, though there's quite a bit of Aramaic uh, in it. And it seeks to systemize the oral traditions about the law that the rabbis were handing down orally. And then there's also the Gomorrah, which is completed around AD 600. Uh, it's written in Aramaic, and you might think of it as a commentary on the Mishnah. And the Mishnah and the Gomorrah together uh, constitute the Babylonian uh, Talmud. The Talmud can be characterized as a great debating club. Uh, that's how uh, Franz uh, Delich, uh, there you see a page of uh, the Talmud in the original Hebrew. You'd have the Mishnah in the middle and the Gomorrah on the outside. Uh, but, uh, but it was a kind of a great debating club where they would uh, debate over the interpretation of the text. And uh, uh, Delich uh, describes it as a vast deb debating, debating club in which uh, hums confusedly the myriad voices of at least five centuries of Jews. Now, the rabbis could go to absurd extremes in their attention to detail. So uh, if you look at the Mishnah, it's a very, uh, uh, very long book. Uh, by the way, there's other traditions called the Midrash or the Midrashim. Uh, a Midrash is a Jewish uh, homiletical exegetical interpretation of the Bible. And there are collections of these known as, as the Midrashim. Uh, the Midrash Rabbah is a large collection of these uh, Midrashim. But anyway, these uh, Jewish homiletical slash exegetical interpretations of the Bible uh, are, are collected and they're studied as a part of the Jewish tradition as well. Uh, some of these are called halakhic midrash or the halakha, which give legal interpretations explaining how Jews ought to live. But then there is Haggadic midrash or the Haggadah, um, stories in the Talmud and other Jewish literature that often have a moral point uh, that uh, uh, but, but basically, they're, they're stories or narratives as opposed to legal uh, midrashim. Uh, but anyway, the midrash, along with the Talmud, uh, play an important role in traditional uh, Judaism. Uh, here's an example of how Haggadic midrash might work. 
this is from a collection of some of them in a work called the uh, Books of uh, Legends uh, or the Legends uh, from the Talmud and the Midrash. Uh, when God created the first man, he took him and caused him to go to and fro from every tree in the Garden of Eden. He said to him, behold, my creations, how beautiful and praiseworthy they are. Whatever I have created, I have created for your sake. Give heed that you not damage and destroy my world. For if you damage it, there is no one to set it aright after you. Now, this is obviously not taken from the Bible because there is no such dialogue between God and the first man in the Garden of Eden that we have. But this is an imaginative uh, recreation, a story to make a moral point that, uh, uh, that if uh, you mess up um, God's creation, you may be stuck with uh, living with it, a, a good moral point, one might add. Uh, but it has nothing to do with uh, what the Bible actually says. Or here's another example. When God created the first man, the ministering angels erred concerning him and wanted to say before him, holy. In other words, uh, the angels wanted to worship man because man is made in the image of God and, and therefore is a, a really great uh, creature. Um, it turns out that uh, this kind of interpretation, we call it midrashic interpretation, is also found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which at least in some of the uh, documents found there, like the Genesis Apocryphon, uh, is basically Haggadic Midrash on the book of Genesis. Well, as we look at some of this Midrashic interpretation, we might ask the question, well, uh, does the Bible, does the New Testament uh, use Haggadic Midrash? And there have been some interpreters that have argued, yes, Robert Gundry in a book on a commentary on Matthew argued that the New Testament indeed does use Midrash and indeed takes uh, Matthew's story of the Magi, uh, the wise men, uh, as a Haggadic Midrash on Luke's story of the shepherds. In other words, Matthew's story is no more historical than some of these Midrash Midrashic things that we've uh, just been talking about, but it basically started with the story of the shepherds and then rewrote it into the story of the Magi. Now, I would argue against this kind of uh, interpretation. Uh, Titus chapter 1 and verse 14 and Titus uh, chapter 3 and verse 9 uh, suggests that uh, Christians uh, had a dim view of Midrashic type interpretation. Uh, chapter 1 and verse 14 uh, For this cause, reprove them severely that they may be found, may be sound in the faith not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. Uh, these Jewish myths uh, sound like uh, uh, Midrashic type interpretations. And then uh, uh, Titus 3.9, but shun foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. And, and so, uh, again, this verse suggests that this whole rabbinic style of learning by debates was not well received by Paul and the early church. Now, how was it that the rabbis interpreted the Bible? Well, uh, Rabbi Hillel formulated some rules of interpretation and uh, these uh, rules of interpretation, uh, uh, you can look at them. They, there's a whole series of them uh, going from light to heavy, uh, an inference drawn from analogy, a general principle established on the basis of teaching contained in one verse, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, he, he came up with these uh, ideas. Uh, Hillel died around AD 10 after the birth of Jesus, but before his ministry. And he actually formulated some seven rules of interpretation. And at least one of the rules does seem to have some evidence of being used in the New Testament. Uh, the rule light to heavy. If something is true in a less important matter, 
it's even more likely that it's going to be true in a more important matter. And this is kind of the way Jesus argued in Luke 12, 24, consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, and, and yet God feeds them. How much more value are you than the birds? In other words, if God cares for minor creatures like ravens, a light matter, how much more would he be expected to care for important creatures like human beings made in the image of God, a heavy matter going from light the heavy. Uh, Jesus is arguing in a way which uh, rabbinic uh, listeners uh, would have understood and appreciated. Again, here are uh, the various rules that are listed. You can see the web page from which I derived it, and you can go through that list uh, if you would like to see Hillel's rules of interpretation. Well, let me move on to another early Jewish interpreter, and that is a man by the name of Alexander, uh, Philo of Alexand Alexander, uh, excuse me, Philo of Alexandria, the city, uh, who is best known for allegorical interpretation. Philo was a Jew that lived in Alexandria, Egypt. He uh, flourished uh, from approximately 20 BC to AD 54. And as he approached the Bible, he had two beliefs that were probably irreconcilable, but he sought to hold them together. One was the belief that the Hebrew Bible is the word of God. And second is that Neoplatonic philosophy is true. Now, the Hebrew Bible and Neoplatonic philosophy contradict at various points, but how can you hold these beliefs together? Well, the way that he attempted to hold these beliefs together was by adopting the allegorical method of interpretation. And by interpreting the text in an allegorical way, it allowed Philo to find Neoplatonic philosophy in the Bible. So, for example, in Genesis 6 and verse 2, uh, it says uh, that a spring, uh, King James translates it myths, but uh, it could be translated spring, a spring went up from the land and watered the whole face of the earth. Well, what does that mean, the Philo asks? Well, according to Philo, the spring is symbolic of the mind and the face of the earth is uh, symbolic of the sensations. And so what this text is really teaching is that the mind covers the sensations, which is directly derived from Neoplatonic philosophy. Now to us, it, it just looks like that Philo is doing eisegesis, reading his Neoplatonic philosophy into the text that is not trying to teach it at all. But that's how he interpreted the text in order to find his Neoplatonic philosophy. Uh, likewise, uh, Philo thought that the Pentateuch had certain stock allegorical symbolisms. And so wherever it talked about Adam, well, Adam represents the mind because I guess men think. And then uh, Eve represents uh, the senses because I guess he thought that the uh, women uh, uh, feel rather than think. Uh, Israel, uh, wherever you see the word Israel, that represents one who sees God. Uh, where we have Moses, that symbol symbolizes wisdom. If you see Egypt, that symbolizes the body. Uh, Eden represents right reason. Aaron represents eloquence or speech. And so wherever Philo saw these words in the Bible, he would interpret them along the lines of these identifications that uh, are listed here. And, and in doing so, that allowed him to read the Bible in an allegorical sense, which he believed underlay the uh, literal sense of the text, um, the allegorical text uh, being the deeper and ultimately the more important meaning of the text. Now, again, Philo's allegories are used to find a Neoplatonic thought in the Bible, and uh, that Neoplatonic uh, thought had kind of a 
twofold world. One was visible and symbolic, uh, emblematic, and the other one was invisible and uh, and uh, uh, but actual. Um, and so, uh, you know, behind every particular chair, there would be an ideal chair. That's kind of a, a Neoplatonic thinking. Behind the literal would be the allegorical. And so the goal of interpreting was to try to tease out that allegorical meaning that is hidden uh, underneath uh, the text. Now, Philo and the way he interpreted the Bible raises several important points. How many meanings does scripture actually have? Is there one meaning to scripture or many meanings of, of scripture? And does biblical inspiration imply the presence of all kinds of mystical hidden meanings uh, in scripture? Now, this uh, allegorizing uh, approach is called by uh, some uh, 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 teachers of hermeneutics, the spiritualizing approach. A spiritualizing approach is an approach to interpreting the Bible that constantly finds mysterious hidden meanings, allegories, symbolisms in the Bible, but allegories and symbolism of which there is no obvious uh, basis uh, in the text read literally. And uh, that raises important issues for us. How often are we like Philo reading into the text a meaning that's alien to it, the way Philo read his Neoplatonic philosophy uh, into the Bible, even though it's not there? Do we impose our preconceived ideologies on the scripture the way that Philo did Neoplatonism? We're all in danger of falling into eisegesis, that is reading into the text, what, the meaning we'd like to find there instead of the meaning that is there. It's hard to be impartial. It's hard to listen to what the text actually says rather than reading our own ideas into the text. And as we see uh, some of the uh, uh, issues raised by uh, uh, Jewish, early Jewish interpreters uh, at Qumran, uh, trying to read prophecy uh, with the you know, current events, uh, like uh, uh, rabbinic Judaism, where we uh, uh, kind of constrain the text with our own commentaries on it, and uh, often make other uh, books uh, as important as the Bible itself, and often engage in Midrashic type speculation that has no basis in the text, or with Philo's case, uh, uh, reading our ideology into the text by spiritualizing it in some way, we're all in danger of these types of mistakes. And so we can learn from uh, the rabbinic uh, interpretation and uh, seek to do better. And so this is uh, my uh, uh, video on early Jewish interpretation of the Bible. And my name is Dr. Joe Sprinkle.